All right. Um, hi, everyone. In this recording, I will present the 2015 article titled Digesting Anomalies and the Investment Approach, published at Review of Financial Studies. This is a joint paper with Ko Wei Ho and Chen Xue. So in this paper, we show that the Q factor model, which consists of the market factor, a size factor, an investment factor, and a uh, profitability factor largely summarizes the cross-sectional variation of average stock returns. So here is our Q factor specification. We have four factors as noted. So market factor, size factor, investment to asset or investment factor, and the return on equity or just ROE factor. So the model says that the risk premium, the expected risk premium of any individual asset or individual portfolio um, contains, contains four components and each component is a product of factor loading or factor beta times its respective factor premiums. The Q factor paper has done well, um, relatively speaking, so as of today, May 31st, 2021, um, the Q Factor paper has collected um, over 2,160 Google Scholar sites and which account for about 20% of my total Google Scholar sites, which currently stand at a bit over 11,000. In terms of web of sign, web of science citations, the Q Factor paper has done well too. And as of today, it has collected the 420 Google Scholar sites. So, so this table reports the basic properties of the Q factors. So the original sample uh, in the paper is from January 1972 to December 2012. The size factor has 31 basis points per month on average, and the, the T value is a little bit above two. Uh, the Kepem Alpha, Pharma French three factor alpha, and the Pharma French Carhartt four factor alpha for the size factor are all relatively small and insignificant. So, look at our investment factor. On average, it earns 45 basis points per month with T value close to five. And the Kepem Alpha, Pharma French three factor alpha, and the Carhartt four factor alpha. Uh, all three alphas are um, significantly positive. The evidence means that the, um, the more traditional, the older generation factor models cannot explain the investment factor in the Q factor model. Uh, finally, our ROE factor on average earns about 58 basis points per month with the T value about 4.8. So again, the now of the uh, more traditional factor models can explain our ROE factor with the CAPM alpha 63 basis points, Pharma, Pharma French three factor alpha earns about 77, and the Cohart four factor alpha is 50 basis points per month, and all three are significant. So in terms of correlation matrix, we see that our size factor uh, is quite highly correlated with SMB in the Pharma French three factor a model, our investment factor and the Pharma French HML the value factor have a high correlation of 0 0.69 and our ROE factor um, has a high correlation of 0 0.5 with the Pharma French UMD factor. This is up minus down momentum factor. So overview of the results. So um, uh, about one half of nearly 80 anomalies that we studied at the time, we find that about one half of them are insignificant with NYC breakpoints and value-weighted decile returns. Uh, in terms of high, high minus low average return, uh, turns out about one half of them are insignificant. In the remaining 35 significant anomalies, so we find that the Q factor model outperforms the Pharma French three factor model and Kohada four factor model. In particular, the average magnitude of high minus low alphas is 20 basis points per month in our model, 
33 basis points in cohort and 55 basis points per month in the pharma French three-factor model. In terms of the number of significant high minus low alphas, not just every average magnitude, the number of significant in terms of T value, uh, the absolute of T value higher than 1.96. We have five in our model. Uh, there are 19 in the cohort four factor model and 27 in the pharma French three factor model. So finally, in terms of number of rejections by the Gibbons, Ross and Schenken 1989 F test um, that which test the alphas of a given set of decimals are jointly zero. So this is a set of 10 alphas at the same time uh, being jointly zero. So um, our model, the Q-factor model is, can be rejected 20 times. There are 20 rejections out of 35. So cohort four-factor model is being rejected, can be rejected 24 times. And then there are 28 rejections in the pharma French three-factor model. So in the rest of the presentation, I'm gonna first describe the economic mechanism behind the Q-factor model. And then I'm gonna describe how we construct the factors, um, testing portfolios we used in our setup and report detailed results on factor regressions, including intercepts and factor loadings. Uh, finally, before conclusion, a little bit of evidence on sharp ratios. So our economic mechanism is based on an economic model of investment-based desert pricing. So um, there are two periods. This is really the simplest uh, model we can think of. Two periods, zero and one, uh, there are heterogeneous firms indexed by I, which goes from one to N, N is a big number, thousands, 3,000, for example, and firm I's operating profits in days zero and one are given by the product of their profitability and the product of assets. So pi zero and pi one um, can be ROE or ROA, a return on equity or return on assets, because in the model, we abstract away from debt financing ROE and ROA are identical. And the A0 and A1 are, are basically productive assets or productive capital. And we, for simplicity, we assume that the uh, depreciation rate is 100% or can be anything between zero and one. The basic results won't change um, because we only derive directional predictions out of this simple model. And M1 is the stochastic discount factor. So firm I's value maximization problem, it's fairly, fairly standard that you will see uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in any textbook in first year uh, macroeconomics, or uh, for example, or corporate finance, for example. Um, so pi zero, sorry, P zero is X dividend firm value, D zero is dividend today. So next period, um, well, in the right-hand side, excuse me, not next period, the right-hand side of the equation. Uh, so, so, so pi zero times A zero, this is economic profits. Uh, firms use the cash or operating cash flow, or economic profits. Firms use cash flow to invest, take away capex, and then pay the related expenses, investment-related expenses. Um, and what you have, the three terms are gonna amount to uh, dividends or free cash flow and we assume um so should we pay out the policy we're just going to assume firms pay whatever free cash flow uh, back to shareholders in other words the three terms amount to d0 which is a uh, dividend at time zero so in the next period firms while well, firms are going to invest this period next period firms are going to have so a1 as the productive assets uh, the firm's going to use that as amount of assets to produce to generate the cash flow, because the model has only two period. Firm's going to use uh, the cash flow distribute the complete amount of cash flow back to shareholders. So that, in a sense, that's the dividends D one, and then because it's next period cash flow, you need to discount that using the pricing kernel. So in other words, the first three terms on the right hand side amount to D zero, and the last term is going to be the X dividend firm, firm value. Um, you can go ahead and write down the optimization condition uh, for the firm's value 
value value maximization by using by choosing optimal investment, and then you're going to get the first principle of investment, um, which says that the left hand side is the marginal costs of investment that include. One is the numeraire, is the purchasing cost of productive assets. We normalize capital goods price to be one. So, uh, so one is the marginal purchasing cost. So A times investment rate. So this is the marginal adjustment costs. Is this quadratic term? Take the first order derivative vis-a-vis -vis investment. You're going to get the marginal adjustment costs. That's given by A times investment rate. So marginal Purchasing cost plus marginal adjustment cost, you get the, the total amount of marginal cost of investment on the left hand side. On the right hand side, uh, the right hand side is basically marginal benefit of that investment is basically marginal Q. So after you pay the marginal cost of investment in the current period, at the beginning of the next period, you have one extra unit of assets or capital you use that to produce to generate the marginal product of capital, in this case, it equals return on asset or return on equity. Uh, that's the amount of incremental cash flow you're going to generate next period. You, 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 you need to discount that using the pricing kernel and you took the to discount that to the current period. The right hand side is basically marginal benefit of investment. Bottom line is that optimal investment condition says that marginal cost of investment equal marginal benefit of investment. So that's, this is the standard investment Euler equation. You can have a dynamic extension. Uh, the model lasts for more than two periods, for example, and you can have data financing uh, and different extensions. So uh, there are many uh, extensions of this uh, framework in the existing literature. But for this paper, um, all we need is the two period model to motivate the investment and our effect. Uh, Coming back to the first principle, you, you still have, you can see that you still have the pricing kernel uh, buried in the middle of it. And this is a, and we try all kinds of ways. Well, there's only actually so far we are aware only one way that is feasible. And we wanna, we wanna, we wanna, we wanna somehow get rid of the pricing kernel. Okay, uh, because uh, uh, the traditional SDF framework has faced a lot of empirical difficulties explaining anomalies. So that's why these empirical patterns are called anomalies. They cannot be explained by the standard uh, consumption cap M uh, based pricing kernel, for example. So, so after a few decades, and we think uh, we should try something else. So the something else we have in mind is 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 the MPV rule. What amounts to be the net present value rule in corporate finance? So basically, uh, we are building on Cochrane 1991 Journal Finance Insight, and uh, uh, later on, uh, elaborate developed further by uh, Resto and Rockinger 1994 Journal Finance paper. It turns out under constant return to scale, and you can write down analytically stock return in terms of fundamentals, firm level accounting variables, okay? So um, let me go through the steps in the two period model. The steps are actually uh, not that complicated. So you have stock return. This is the standard definition of stock return. So stock price next period plus cash flow next period divided by current period stock price. And uh, um, because the world lasts for only two period, uh, stock price at next period is going to be equal to zero because the firm going to be liquidate at the end of the second period. Okay, so it's going to be worth zero and the cash flow is going to be worth basically operating cash flow. So dividend is going to be equal to operating cash flow in period one, which is the second period, pi one times A1, yeah? And which is this amount being discounted as uh, mentioned earlier. And uh, also as noted earlier, X dividend firm value today, P0, is basically this uh, conditional expectation uh, term given at, at the end of the firm objective function because the first three terms are going to amount to D0, okay? So that's how we get the second equation. So, and then you're going to cancel A1 
uh, assets in the next period, both in the numerator and denominator, and you get to this form, okay? And then to, to, to derive the last equation, so we're gonna substitute the marginal cost of investment. Uh, we're gonna plug that in. We're gonna replace this marginal Q term with the pricing kernel embedded in there, embedded in there. We're gonna replace that out uh, by, by, the, by the marginal cost of investment. So this way uh, we, 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 we achieve some separation uh, from the pricing kernel uh, class of models and thereby avoid sidestep its empirical difficulties. So bottom line is that you have stock return equals profitability divided by marginal cost of investment. And this formulation turns out to be uh, quite powerful empirically. In particular, if we take expectation on both sides, we get discount rate or expected return equals expected profitability divided by marginal cost of investment. Right? So if I replace the, the expected return with the denominator on the right hand side, I'm going to have marginal cost of investment equals expected profitability or expected cash flow divided by the discount rate. Okay. In other words, this is basically a reformulation of the uh, net present value rule in corporate finance, uh, which says that firms will keep investing, uh, keep taking positive MPV projects until the last project infinitesimally small project the firm takes, its marginal cost, the cost of that incremental project, uh, it's gonna satisfy the optimality condition that marginal costs gonna equal the present value of that project. And the present value is given by the expected cash flow divided by the, the, divided by the discount rate, okay? So bottom line is that we're gonna turn uh, net present value rule in corporate finance as an asset pricing theory. And the, we have been demonstrating in, partic in particular in this paper uh, that this new perspective is quite powerful uh, in the data empirical uh, in terms of its empirical performance. So intuitively it says that OLS being equal, high investment stocks are gonna have lower cost of capital and therefore earn lower rates of returns going forward on average than low investment stocks. And OLS being equal uh, means that you, you, you keep uh, profitability level roughly constant. So, um, so this is uh, basically in philosophy of economics. So we're describing a tendency, okay? And an inexact law of nature. We're talking, we're dragging along some uh, or else being equal uh, clauses, uh, cadmus paribus clauses. <laughs> All right. So um, on the other hand, that we have uh, or else being equal, stocks with high expected profitability are going to earn higher uh, rates of returns going forward. Right here, um, because they have higher cost of capital uh, to offset the higher profitability, such that the investment level is not too high, okay? So, so that's the intuition. Basically high expected, high expected prof profitability uh, in the numerator relative to uh, relatively low level of investment in the denominator that must be implying higher cost of capital as um, higher cost of capital. Um, as the ratio, or in other words, the firm's gonna earn higher uh, rates of returns going forward. A little bit, so, 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 so that was the intuition for the investment factor as well as the profitability factor. So now we're gonna argue that, the, uh, that these two factors have broad explanatory uh, power empirically in the data. So let's start with the investment factor. So, so I have a graph here on the vertical axis. We have discount rate, horizontal axis, we have investment asset. So we just described that uh, because based on the net present value rule in corporate finance, all else being equal, we're gonna have a negative correlation be between uh, investment rate and discount rate. So I have high investment firms located down here, uh, or else being equal, they're gonna be associated with low cost of capital, therefore earn lower rates of returns going forward on average. So while as high investment, so, sorry, uh, while as low investment firms, or else being equal, they're gonna have high discount rates and earn higher rates of returns going forward. So next we have 
Um, SEO stands for season equity offerings. IPO stands for uh, initial public offering. So this is Jay Reader's uh, prominent, uh, very influential work on long-term performance uh, following IPOs and SEOs, as well as convertible bonds that uh, uh, and, 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 and other, other researchers have documented and the review convertible bonds as fairly close to uh, equity issues. So it turns out in the data, uh, equity issuers have much higher investment rates than non-issuer, non-equity issuers or equity non-issuers with similar size and book to market and other characteristics. So these are called the matching non-issuers in the literature. So intuitively, equity issuers, they tend to invest more and should earn lower rates of returns going forward than on average than their matching non-issuers. In other words, the long-term performance following underperformance following equity insurance, it's another reflection, another manifestation of our investment factor. On the other side of the equity issues, you have TO of a maintenance um, over long-term overperformance following uh, share open market share repurchases or even dividend payouts, for example. So, and if you take um, equity issues minus uh, equity repurchases and you get net stock issues, uh, it turns out empirically uh, firms with high net stock issues also turn out to be high investment firms. Uh, they will earn lower rates of returns going forward than low net stock issue firms. Now, value versus growth. So very, very well-known anomaly, although its recent performance in the past, uh, especially in the past uh, three to five years has been, has, been, has, been, has been poor, but nevertheless, in the, in the, in the, in the longer horizon uh, since 1926 that we have data for, uh, the performance uh, is, is, seems reasonable. So value versus growth is another manifestation of the investment factor. In particular, growth firms with high Tobin skew, high stock market valuation ratios, uh, low book to market equity because market equity is high. So book to market uh, is gonna be low. So growth firms with high market, high Q, high Tobin skew, they're gonna invest more uh, based on uh, based on the net present value rule, or in, in terms of economic theory, based on a uh, newer classical Q theory of investment, growth firms are going to invest uh, more than value firms, and growth firms should have lower, should be associated with lower cost of capital and earn lower rates of returns going forward. So I also have market leverage right here. So it turns out in the data, book leverage is not that related with future uh, returns on average, uh, but the market, the market leverage is positively related with average returns, okay? So because the market leverage has market equity in the denominator, we interpret market leverage as another uh, indication, another metric of value versus growth, okay? So we're following uh, Pharma French 1992 interpretation. So again, firms with low market leverage are going to have low, are going to have high investment because their Tobin skew is high. Uh, going forward, they should earn lower rates of returns on average. And deep on the Thaler, next deep on Thaler's uh, famous overreaction anomaly 1985 at Journal of Finance. All right, so firms with high long-term high prior returns, okay, long-term as in the past three to five years, firms with high long-term prior returns, these are, these, are, these are growth firms on average, okay? So they are uh, long-term, in other words, long-term winners tend to have higher uh, total skill and they're gonna have uh, higher investment rates than firms than, than long-term losers or firms with long-term, uh, poor long-term prior returns, okay? So long-term winners are gonna invest more and earn lower rates of returns going forward than long-term losers. So in this paper, we also described um, um, a accrual anomaly. Um, so, so in this, the accrual is, quite a bit more complicated, but this graph, so uh, we interpret the accrual as working capital investment. Uh, working capital, this includes inventory, 
um, account receivables. Uh, for example, basically when firm when a firm is growing quite a bit, right? The firm is going to accumulate quite a bit of inventory, ac accumulate quite a bit of uh, account receivables, so the accruals are going to be high. All right. So the investment mechanism are going to say, uh, look, these firms are going to have uh, are going to be associated with the lower cost of capital and earn low rates of returns going forward than firm firms with lower uh, accruals. So I will come back to the accrual anomaly uh, later. So um, accrual turns out to be uh, quite intriguing uh, in the sense that most anomalies are riding either on only one dimension in our uh, Q factor setup and later on the Q5 setup, in, including expected, uh, including our expected growth factor. So most anomalies are basically the investment anomaly, uh, different manifestations of our investment factor or ROE factor. In the case of a accrual, it's, it's loading simultaneously on our investment factor, profitability factor, as well as the expected growth factor. And only after we throw in expected growth uh, in the Q5 model, can we fully account for um, Richard's uh, famous 1996 article accounting review on operating uh, accruals. So uh, composite issues, this is a different uh, uh, match, measure of net stock issues and a combination of equity issues and, uh, and, uh, and the share repurchase. So I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah. So the intuition, the economic mechanism is quite similar to what we have already described. So this is our investment factor and as well as its applications in the cross section. So the ROE factor, um, um, again, the basic intuition is that high ROE um, relative to low investment must mean high discount rates, right? Uh, counterfactual uh, exp thought experiment, suppose the discount rates were low, okay? Low discount rates, high ROE or high future cash flow. Low discount rates would imply high net present value of new projects and therefore high investment, all right? So and that's contradiction. Right, high, you cannot have high investment later on and this, uh, with the beginning starting point of low investment. That's a contradiction and therefore that means that the discount rates must be high. So discount rates must be high to offset, counteract the high uh, cash flow, high profitability to induce low investment. So in other words, so in our uh, simple two period setup, Investment, profitability, and expect return are three endogenous variables. They have to obey the nonlinear relation that uh, I showed you earlier. Okay, and that's uh, economic as in, in exact because lots of OLs being equal clauses being buried in there. But this is the net present value rule in corporate finance by itself. It's not controversial at all. We teach the stuff to MBA students for decades. Okay, so which is somewhat still controversial is to use the MPV rule as an asset pricing theory. Okay, we, um, uh, in subsequent work, I call this asset pricing theory the investment cap M, and I have lots to do in terms of uh, persuading my academ academic colleagues uh, that the investment cap M is a uh, prom promising way of doing asset pricing research because it changes many, many, many. Uh, things in at the at the at the big picture level. All right. So for now, let's get back to the ROE factor. Um, uh, that's the economic mechanism behind the ROE factor. It uh, it turns out that it has it has many manifestations uh, in the anomalies in the gigantic anomalies literature as well. In particular, price and earnings and momentum. Yeah, accounting is this is called the post earnings announcement drift. Price the earnings momentum winners uh, tend to have high higher ROE and they should earn higher rates of returns going forward than price and the momentum losers. In addition, financial distress, low distressed firms actually have low ROE firms. They should earn lower rates of returns going forward than more distressed firms. So, so at first glance, the financial distress anomaly. Uh, look quite counterintuitive, quite puzzling. It turns out it fits together with the, uh, the investment framework kind of nicely. 
All right. So uh, in terms of implementation, so a bit um, touching on uh, as touching on some of the uh, deeper um, epistemic um, or philosophical issues. So the investment model is based on firm characteristics. So uh, let me let me go back. Right. So the right hand side, it's firm level variables. Firm level. Uh, in theory, this economic um, profitability denominator is investment. Okay, investment rate. Of course, once we take the theory to the data, we to make contact with real data, we have to make a whole list of auxiliary assumptions, right? So in, in the implementation, um, so we're gonna take, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna implement a factor model instead of, a, instead of a structural estimation on the, on, the, on, the, on the structural parameters, in this case, A, and then construct the expected return purely based on the right-hand side. And that's a different research direction, and we're actively pursuing as well. But in the but in this paper, in the Q factor paper, we opt to implement the factor model. Okay, and that brings us to the well-known covariances versus um, um, uh, or this well-known debate dated back to Daniel Tittman and David Swammer French. What, um, what the traditional surprising theory says that the uh, risks drive everything, owning covariance is better, but Daniel Tittman argue, uh, look, look at the evidence. It's all accounting level variables, right? Firm level variables, they are the ones that drive everything uh, even after controlling uh, for covariances. So, but the model, but in the model, uh, we're gonna argue that Look, even in the in a, a perfectly a rational model, so as a starting point at least, right? If you look at the uh, right hand side, it's not like covariances do not matter. They matter, but they matter only in the background. So, so this is the first order condition. So, all the impact of shareholder risk aversion, for example, okay. So, and the co-movements of firms level cash flows with the aggregated economy, all those potential risk factors, uh, they are already buried in the firm's optimal investment decision, right? And uh, uh, it's right here. So in the previous slide, I showed that whatever the pricing kernel impact we can um, exploit, we can take advantage of the first order condition and we can replace the pricing kernel term, you know, by using the first law condition, replace this term with replace marginal Q, which has pricing kernel embedded with the current period marginal cost of investment, right? And uh, that's, we can measure um, purely based on firm level variables, right? So it's a bit philosophical departure. So, uh, vis-a-vis -vis the existing literature. So we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're, we're gonna work with firm level variables. So bit other implementation details, returns are better measured on then accounting variables. Uh, so factor mimicking portfolio, but it's less important than the you know, conceptual point that the, that the firm level variables should matter to begin with, okay? Um, I noted earlier, estimating the economic model directly involves specification errors. Uh, in the structural estimation, this includes uh, production technology, investment technology, uh, different aggregations. So how do you deal with the heterogeneous capital goods, you know, tangible, intangible working capital and whatnot, right? Lots of things to think about as factor model is fairly convenient. Uh, it's simple, simplicity, and you can apply the factor model to a wide range of um, anomaly variables. So a uh, bottom line is that we're gonna, we're gonna interpret the Q factor model as a linear approximation of the nonlinear investment return model. So Cochrane calls the right hand side investment return, and that's has been the standard uh, terminology. And you see that the investment return is a nonlinear uh, equation. We're going to implement the Q factor model in effect as a linear factor approximation of the of uh, of this nonlinear equation. Now let's look at how we construct the factors. We formed our size investment ROE factors uh, from a triple two by three by three sort on size investment to ROE. 
Uh, variable definition size is fairly standard. Price per share times shares outstanding from CRISP investment. We are following Cooper Gould and Shell paper, 2008 Journal of Finance. Uh, investment is annual changes in total assets uh, scaled by lack to total assets. So in other words, investment is total asset growth. So ROE, we're gonna use income standard, you know, simplest place to start. Income before extraordinary items uh, divided by one quarter lacked uh, book equity. The procedure, and you can see, you know, pharma French influence on us everywhere. So we're following the um, standard pharma French methodology, um, uh, uh, factor approach, 1993, 1996. Uh, papers in particular. So we use NYSC breakpoints, 50-50 uh, for size, 30-40-30% for investment to asset, and 30-40-30 for return on equity. So we're going to be using annual sorts in June end um, on the market equity. And we're going to use annual sorts on investment to assets for the physical year ending calendar last calendar year. And we're gonna do monthly sorts at the beginning of each month on return on equity with the most recently announced uh, quarterly earnings. Later on, we extend this in the early examples when the quarterly announcement dates that are not available. Uh, we did a bit more ex extension to extend the sample backwards from January, 1972 72 backwards to 67. So the timing is consistent with theory. Uh, by timing, I mean frequency, right? So um, uh, we do monthly source on ROE while annual sorts on investment. Why do we do that? Go back to the equation. So in theory, it's not high profitability stocks earn higher rates of returns. It is high expected profitability stocks. Keep in mind the pi one is stated once as future profitability. So it's it, in theory it's expected profitability. And in practice, we, we, we simply use current profitability as a proxy for the expected uh, profitability, expected ROE. Uh, if you think or ROE or earnings follows our AR1 process and you want to use the most up-to-date information, okay? As opposed to four quarter, uh, um, three additional quarter lacked uh, earnings. So that's why we ended up using uh, monthly sorts on ROE. So that's consistent with theory, well as investment assets. So we have reported a set of alternative factor constructions in the internet appendix for this paper in which we use monthly sorts on investment to asset as well. And the results are quite, quite, quite close. So we ended up using annual sorts because, uh, because, uh, uh, because it's more traditional to implement uh, like value, for example, um, the book to, book to market using annual sorts and in theory, in theory, investment and value are exchangeable, okay? So we ended up using annual sorts on investment. So we also do joint sorts on investment and ROE, okay? So I'll say this is a triple source on size, investment and ROE. The reason is again, consistent with theory, going back to the equation, it says all else being equal, right? All else being equal, higher profitability relative to investment earn higher rates of returns. Or else being equal, high investment relative to low profitability earn lower rates of returns going forward. And it is the three equations that follow this nonlinear relation. In particular, in the data, investment and profitability also tend to be positively correlated. Profitable firms tend to invest more. So that's why we ended up doing the triple sort on size investment ROE and in order to construct our investment and ROE factors on top of that as a added the empirical benefit that our investment factor and ROE factor are pretty uh, uncorrelated in the data is only 6%, which is, which is small. 
Testing portfolios, again, so you can see the design, um, you can recognize the design follows heavily uh, Pharma French 1996 a paper, which is really uh, probably the most um, successful uh, asset pricing paper in that decade. We use an extensive array of anomaly variables, uh, close to 80 at the time. Later on, we substantially expanded our testing portfolios. So the scope is comparable at the time with the largest in the literature, Greenhand Zhang, uh, 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 Harvey Liu and Zhu paper. Uh, they have, uh, uh, Kim's paper with co-authors have a lot of macro factors, okay? So McLean Pontiff at the time at the, about, the, about the, later on they extended to 100, at the time they only had the, like 82. So we're gonna be using NYSE breakpoints and value-weighted returns to mitigate the impact of micro caps. So uh, Pharma made this point early on, early version of this point uh, in his 1998 GFE article. So later on the Pharma French 2008 uh, made the big point that made the point, the important point about the micro caps. Uh, again, that's a point that we take uh, quite seriously. Uh, there are six categories of an anomalies. The first category is uh, its momentum. So at the time we only have 80 and later on in our replicating anomalies paper, we you know, expanded drastically to 452. So, and so right now we have you know, uh, earnings momentum. Uh, this is price momentum from Jack condition Titman, industry momentum and the Pharma French 96 version of the price momentum. Value versus growth, book to market, uh, market leverage, uh, Lacan shock life and vision is sales growth, and teach us on Solomon's equity duration, and uh, uh, Lacan shock life and vision is cash flow to price, okay, and of course deep bond failures, long term reversal. Uh, investment includes not only real investment but also. Uh, equity issues and accruals. So, and um, and Sheridan's famous work uh, with co-authors, 2004 HAFQA, that's the first paper in finance that documents the investment effect. So Cooper Gordon shows investment to asset and Yuhan's investment growth, uh, Pontiff Woodgate net stock issues. Um, and Richard Sloan's operating accruals, total accruals as well, and the percent accruals. Profitability, ROE and ROA, um, gross profits, uh, F score, and O score and failure probability. And this is the financial, uh, A financial distress anomaly. Intangibles, we have organi organizational capital, brand capital, advertisement, R&D to market, so uh, corporate governance, accounting uh, quality and all. So yeah, so, so this includes not only like narrowly defined intangibles, but we throw in uh, some other uh, variables as well. So um, trading frictions, market equity, idiosyncratic volatility, total volatility, short-term reversal, uh, share price, this lot of the, you know, trading volume, uh, liquidity variables. So it turns out that we were, you know, slowly converging to our point in replicating anomalies paper, even in this early article. And we find that out of the 80 variables, close to one half, okay, of the variables are actually insignificant. And these are the insignificant anomalies. So um, uh, including 12 out of 13 liquidity related variables at the time we simply dismissed the evidence. Well, we didn't dismiss the evidence. We, we just didn't make a big deal out of it. Uh, we didn't make a big deal. Um, and then later on, we, we, we thought we only looked at 13 liquidity variables Basically, maybe we have a little bit of a sample selection issue. And later on in replicating anomalies, we expanded the sample to 106. It uh, turns out one, two, 102, 102 variables on liquidity and trading. Frict frictions and microstructure are insignificant. And then we realize at uh, that point we need to uh, really emphasize, which we did in, uh, in, in, in our 2020 RFS paper on replicating anomalies.
But for now, let me go back to the uh, uh, Q factor regressions. So look at the alpha, this is the high minus low, uh, zero investment portfolios, um, um, including average return as well as its factor regressions. So, so SUE1, this is the earning surprise with one month holding period, the monthly sorts on average earns about 45 basis points per month and T value is 3.5. So both the pharma French alpha and cohort alpha are significant, but not the Q alpha. Q alpha is 16 basis points and T value 1.1. So, and this is the GRS P value and our model is not rejected out of uh, 10 SUE1 deciles, whereas the pharma French three and the cohort four factor models can be rejected. So overall, but overall you see that uh, um, out of this nine at the time, we only, uh, we coded up uh, nine momentum anomalies, average returns are all significant, okay? So you look at the pharma French three factor model, we basically replicated their 96 article. One of the key results there is that three factor model cannot explain momentum and we have that uh, all their T values are significant. And the, the mean absolute alpha is 85 basis points per month. If you add momentum factor UMD as in Carhartt, uh, you explain uh, four individual uh, high minus low, winner minus loser, alphas, uh, there are still a few that you cannot explain. And the mean absolute alpha drops to 29 basis points per month. The Q factor alpha, we do okay. We only have 19 basis points. So uh, only two momentum anomalies are significant in our setup. And this is basically uh, abnormal returns surrounding earnings announcement dates with one month and six month holding period. Um, However, I should point out uh, we have quite a few GRS rejections, rejections using uh, Gibbons and Ross and Schenken F test. So, in terms of uh, factor loadings and the characteristics in our setup, uh, you can see that it is the ROE factor that is doing most of the um, work, uh, that's pulling most of the weight in the Q factor model. You see that the, the ROE winner minus loser ROE factor loadings are all highly significant. Well, other than APR one is significant, but not that highly. Um, and uh, but for the all, all the other cases, the factor loadings ROE factor loadings are large, and quite significant. And uh, you look at the characteristics per se, the ROE. Right, the calculations again. This is a highly significant differences. On the other hand, the higher ROE is a bit, uh, bit uh, persistent, and uh, you know, so these T values are probably uh, inflated a bit. But nevertheless, the, in terms of economic magnitudes, uh, the ROE uh, differences are, are, are pretty large. And keep in mind, this ROE is quarterly ROE. This is per quarter. Um, in terms of investment factor loading, you see is pretty close to zero. They're small and the none of the uh, other than one T value right here for APR6, most of the T values for the investment factor loadings are insignificant. So in other words, the ROE factor explains momentum mostly. Uh, so in other words, different momentum anomalies are different manifestations of our ROE factor. And again, keep in mind that profitability is an economic fundamental variable. So for value versus growth in terms of alpha, so our mean absolute alpha is actually um, quite a bit higher than the pharma French three factor model. And uh, uh, although individually the in, in terms of a significant um, value versus growth alpha, we have one uh, so does the pharma French three factor model and cohort model. Okay, so in that on, 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 in that dimension, the model performance is roughly similar. We have two GIS tests and pharma French cohort have one. 
In terms of uh, factor loadings and characteristics, uh, you see it is the investment factor loading that is doing, doing the job. By the way, we always do high minus low. So that's why you see high duration is actually growth firms. So, and that's why high minus low duration, you have a negative average, uh, you have negative average return 54 basis points per month, T value 2.6. But this is another, this is growth minus value as opposed to value minus growth. Uh, and in terms of uh, investment factor loadings, and our investment factor is low minus high investment. So therefore, uh, value minus growth means low minus high investment. That's why, so the investment value minus growth investment factor loadings are all uh, significantly positive. You have to, again, you have to flip the sign on duration. Well, as for ROE, it's a little bit difference, not the whole lot. And for book to market, the loading, the, 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 um, the ROE factor loading is significant, but otherwise is uh, it's insignificant. In terms of um, characteristics dispersion, so value invest less than grow, right? As in the data, which is consistent with the with the big investment factor graph I showed you earlier. And the differences are highly, the dispersions are highly significant. So a little bit the ROE dispersion as well and other now well, kind of significant also. Uh, but the bottom line is that the dispersion in the investment is sufficiently uh, large to overpower the dispersion in ROE in the numerator to turn value versus growth positive in our model. All right, so for the investment factor, for the investment anomalies, again, uh, um, I, again, in terms of mean absolute error, you can see that, that the Q factor model does pretty well. And for the individual significance, anomaly significance, so we, we screw up uh, Richard Sloan's operating uh, accrual. So our alpha is 57 and Pharma French three factor model only has 37. And the, although all three are, all three alphas are significant. The alphas are all significant across all three models. So bottom line is that other than one, we only have one significant investment anomaly, but you know, Pharma French have um, all but one are uh, all significant. However, I should mention the model, the Q factor model is powerful enough that the, that the model is still being rejected by the GIS F test. So in terms of uh, loadings and characteristics, so I keep reporting loadings and accounting variables together. Uh, because you know this <laughs> goes back to my earlier discussion about the philosophical point. Because in my mind, covariance and firm level accounting variables, and these are all equivalent. Okay, these are all equivalent explanatory uh, variables going forward. In terms of explaining quote unquote explaining returns. So I, I'm I'm in the middle of uh, constructing constructing my philosophical arguments by digging into philosophy of science literature. It turns out it's a big literature of scientific ex explanation, all right? So, it, um, so oftentimes we are stuck, the existing literature is stuck with the view that only covariances matter. So asset pricing is all about the pricing kernel uh, because you are subscribing to SDF view of the world, okay? But it turns out that's, the not, that's not the only model even within the efficient Russian expectations paradigm uh, to explain, expect, uh, to explain uh, returns, okay? So um, I'll come back to this point, um, not in this presentation, but in my future work. Uh, bottom line is that if you look at loadings, uh, dispersion for investment, not surprisingly, this is, uh, the investment anomaly is all explained by investment loadings. Uh, for, um, other than two cases, uh, net operating assets, it's kind of a accrual measure and uh, uh, Sloan's operating accrual, uh, but all the other uh, factor loadings are highly significant for investment. So in terms of investment variable itself, accounting variable itself, 
you see, you know, not surprisingly, you see all kinds of, uh, um, so uh, high investment firms, of course, invest more than low investment firms and the T values are mostly um, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty big. The fourth category we looked at is uh, profitability. And you see that we, in this case, we only have five variables and later on we expand this to a lot more variables later on in our Q5 paper and the evidence is uh, it's pretty similar. But for now, among these five significant uh, profitability anomalies and our mean absolute alpha is only 12 basis points per month and pharma French three factor model has 95. Okay, so none of our uh, alphas are significant but, uh, but they're all significant in the earlier uh, generation factor models. So only failure, prof uh, failure probability can reject the Q factor model using a GIS test, uh, but we do pretty well otherwise in other sets. Again, factor loadings and accounting variables uh, directly. So profitability, and not surprisingly, is the ROE factor that's doing the job. And again, we always do high minus slow in terms of failure probability. High failure probability, actually high distress, that means low probability, okay? So you have to flip the sign to line up on economic grounds with the rest of the signs. So in terms of the ROE accounting variable itself, again, high profitable firms are gonna be more profitable than low profitable firms. All right, so intangibles and trading frictions, again, they're only like one uh, or two, actually just one. This is um, uh, syst uh, systematic volatility uh, from Anne Hotrick, uh, Xing and Zhang paper, famous paper on uh, idiosyncratic uh, volatility, low risk anomaly. So in this case, um, in I mean, we reported detailed results in the internet appendix on idiosyncratic volatility, but it turns out only systematic volatility in our setup and clears the 5% um, uh, single test hurdle. So it's insignificant. So we do pretty well there. Um, one thing that is anonymous for us is R&D to market. So actually we, blow up the error big time. So Pharma French three factor model only has 20, 22, but we have 60, our alpha. And our alpha is significant, but not in the three factor model or cohort model. And here is the reason. So you look at R&D, uh, on average is 63 basis points per month and fairly, fairly, fairly big, I would say, although a little bit noisy uh, the T value is only 2.3, uh, but if you look at the uh, factor loadings as well as the accounting variables, it turns out R and D high R and D to market firms load the wrong way in our profitability factor. Okay, and uh, doesn't load much on our investment factor, and this makes total sense, right? This is the uh, gap accounting, generalized accounting, accepted accounting principles. So firms do a lot of R&D and other forms of intangible investments. Okay, firms do a lot of R&D. Uh, they're gonna expense intangible investments from earnings. As a result, because our ROE factor is built directly on earnings. So our ROE factor is gonna be dead in the water because the loading is gonna go directly the wrong way. All right, our loading as an active sign, but our high R&D firms are gonna earn higher rates of returns. So, and this opens the door. We started to think, okay, this is a problem. And uh, this opens the door for our uh, expected growth factor later on in our Q5 paper. So 25 size and book to market portfolios, uh, alpha. So this is um, uh, table one in Pharma French 1996. And you can see enormous influence that Pharma French have on our, our work and during my four years, junior, junior faculty years, 2002 to 2006, when I was on the Rochester faculty. So I spent most of my time uh, reading Pharma French papers and carefully absorbing their way of thinking and learn how to do empirical work. So, 
Um, so this is, this is a table one in Pharma French 96. So this is 25 size and book to market portfolios, average return. And we see that the value premium is highest in small stocks. Okay, not surprisingly, 1.02% uh, per month. And, 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 and this is a small growth, small value. You see small uh, growth is making very, very low returns on average while small value is high, right? And uh, in terms of Pharma French three-factor model, we mostly replicate uh, their results. You see that the, the three-factor model has trouble explaining the small growth anomaly with the alpha 54 basis points per month and T value 4.8. And uh, the value premium is stronger. The alpha is stronger in small firms and the, and the T value as well, okay? So, and the mean absolute alpha is about 10 basis points per month. So this is the cohort four factor model. The results are roughly comparable. Um, so 11 versus 10 basis points and the value premium is still stronger among small firms. So the Q factor alpha is comparable also, okay? So we do not have a small growth anomaly. You see that alpha is only 25 basis points. So I think the ROE factor is sucking up some of the problems uh, that are associated with small growth firms because this, uh, these stocks have very low uh, ROE levels. So, and the T value for that portfolio is insignificant whereas we have now, uh, we, have, we have a little bit of a small value anomaly left, 32 basis points and T value 2.7. Uh, Bottom line is that in explaining the 25 size and book market portfolios, the Q factor performance is comparable uh, to the extremely influential Pharma French three factor model. Um, little bit sharp ratio, so, so these are the individual factors. So individually we have 20, this is monthly, monthly sharp ratio, 0.24 for our investment factor, 0.22 for our ROE factor. And in terms of maximum sharp ratio, this is uh, um, um, basically uh, in, 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 in Markowitz portfolio, optimal portfolio construction, right? You can, you can out of a, a set of risky assets, you can, you can, you can maximize sharp ratio and chase a hyperbola. This is chapter five or six, I think chapter five in Bodhi Kenamaka's uh, standard investments textbook. So you, you can use the uh, factors within a factor model to construct the maximized sharp ratio, right? And our maximized sharp ratio, maximum sharp ratio is uh, 0.43 in our model. And that's higher than either Pharma French three factor model and cohort four factor model. All right, so let me conclude in this paper, we demonstrate that the Q factor model uh, goes a long way in summarizing uh, the cross-sectional variation of average stock returns. Thank you.